Okay, so um, today we're going to be covering a, a topic um, that uh, I did not cover uh, with some chagrin during um, the discussion group um, that we started in 2020. Um, it's uh, probably the single biggest omission from coverage there uh, that I found myself regretting. And uh, it concerns uh, an idea or a cluster of ideas that um, are in some ways at the heart of category theory. Some, some argue that um, they constitute some of the most important ideas uh, within the categorical perspective. Um, and uh, you'll find it popping up in many, in, in coverage of many topics within category theory again and again and again. Um, and uh, I think for this reason, although it can seem a little bit dry, um, it's extremely important that we cover this topic of universal constructions and their associated universal properties. It turns out that um, it has uh, direct, they, they have direct programming analogs, which you have through the videos, you know, come to see, but uh, more than that, um, it provides a, a basis for understanding the categorical perspective uh, further. So I'm, I'm gonna switch over here to my screen and we'll get up some, um, some comments on this. So I'd asked you to watch this program of categories lecture six. I'm gonna turn down the, the washed out um, uh, light here a little bit. Okay. Um, I, I'd asked you to watch this uh, program of categories lecture six where Brendan Fong and then Bartosz Mielewski talk about um, some universal constructions um, and give reference to the universal properties. Um, I also asked you to watch Eugenia Chung's um, uh, talks through Catsters on terminal initial objects and products and co-products. Um, if you continue on from both of these, there's some wonderful material there. For example, on co-products, um, she doesn't reach those, I think, into products and co-products too. Um, and there's some great stuff on initial objects after terminal objects and later versions of this series that I'd, I'd suggest. So some themes associated with this um, are listed here as follows. Um, number one, it, it's kind of this, um, this categorical view is of what distinguishes um, distinguishes something is the roles it plays within uh, within a category. Um, it, it's not its elements. It's not you know looking inside of it. It's it's um, how does it play a role in this broader ecosystem of 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 other objects and morphisms. Um, it's it's a, it's importance emerging from a network of relationships, um, and we use kind of existing constructs to, in terms of morphisms and and objects to to define these objects of interest. Um, and a universal construction, um, in some ways, represents the essence or the best or some notion of perfection with respect to some property, with respect to some characteristic. Um, and, uh, you know, the term Dave Spivak uses for it is kind of, we're defining these one-stop shops. It's kind of the very essence of parenthood, the very essence of, of being kind of the, the initial object or, or being a, um, a sort of sum of, of different possibilities. Um, and uh, these constructions are defined. Uh, the properties are defined based on the network of relationships, not, not on the particular internals. And within this um, 
there were introduced terminal objects and then initial objects and products. Um, uh, within these lectures, co-products that I, I listed here, co-products were actually not included as a topic of discussion, um, but uh, will emerge and uh, form uh, a beautiful example of the value of, of uh, looking at the duals of a category. Um, also prominent in the discussion was this idea of a commuting diagram. The fact that if we can get from you know, uh, one, one object to another via two different ways, um, the restriction that they have to commute. We saw this with, with composition um, uh, earlier that um, there are times where for something to be a, to be a functor in particular, um, we, we want a certain triangle to commute. Um, but uh, here it's, it's quite central to some of these definitions. Um, uh, the lecture also introduced Haskell code for pair um, to serve as kind of the universal construction of the process uh, of, of product. And there was this, um, this observation that that translates directly into Haskell code. And you can demonstrate um, for any other object that um, you can characterize it as a mapping through pair. Um, that given any other object that is mapping to A and a mapping to B, um, the, the, it's going to be the functions from it to uh, A and B are going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with a function to A cross B or, or these pairs. Um, and uh, using these universal constructions, we could define things which build higher level mappings, uh, much as we do when we lift a function, um, for example, with a functor. Um, so um, just as a reminder, there were uh, three types of things talked about here. One was a terminal object. Um, this is a universal construction. It's defined as defined using a universal property, universal in the sense of saying, like a terminal object in C in a category C is an object T such that for any other object in this category or for any object, any object, including T in this category C, um, there exists a unique morphism, not just any morphism, a unique one from this other object to T. So it's an object that's pointed to by every other object with exactly one morphism possible. Um, and nice categories um, often include this, but you, there, there's many categories where it doesn't exist, um, or or where there might be several such terminal objects, um, in which case they're isomorphic to one another, and that's actually a fairly easy thing to prove. Uh, we, I'd be glad to to talk about uh, how it's proven. It's kind of a nice example of of the properties of of a category, um, and it turns out a terminal object will be seen can be seen as an example of something called a, a limit, um, which is very important concept uh, in category theory, which comes up again and again and again. And um, we may uh, return to it. So um, uh, here in set, the terminal object um, is one. Uh, well, you tell me, what's the terminal object in set? Can anyone say from the from the video, what's the terminal object in set? What is the set such that for any other set, there exists exactly one function from that other set to this terminal set? What would that be? A singleton set. Singleton set, yeah. Because there's no choice in the matter. Um, if we have a set of three possible, here, here we have a set of, of three 
possible items. Um, uh, and if we have a, a map pick to singleton set, we have to specify for the first possible value, what's, the va what's its value? Well, we only have one choice. It's, it says second possible one, what, what could it possibly be? It, it's also that single value of the singleton set. There's only one value it can have. Um, three, only one value it could have. Um, there's only one possible function, which just maps all of these possibilities in this other set into the single possible value in the singleton set. And this is true if you have a, a set two when you're considering the number of mappings here. It's, it's only one possible mapping. Each and every value in this other set has to go to the single value. Um, because of that, every other set within the category set has exactly one morphism, exactly one function, because we're in the category of sets and functions, morphisms or functions, from that set into the singleton set. Um, and I might note this is true for if, if lowercase c here is t itself, right? There's only one mapping from itself into itself, which is the what mapping. It's the, begins with an I, it ends with a D. Oh, okay, well, or, or Y if you want. It's the, I, it's the identity morphism. Every object has an identity morphism and that's the only one this has. I mean, what else can it do? It takes a single possibility in it. What else can it give you back? It's a, it's a function. All morphisms here are functions because we're in a category of set. So objects are sets, morphisms are functions. And what is this function? Well, it takes the only value and it gives you the same blooming thing back. That's it. It's the only possibility. Okay. That's a terminal object. It has a single morphism to itself and every other object has a single morphism to it. Mm. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, but the, the set with a smiley face only has, is also a terminal set. Yeah, that's true. Um, any set with a single element is distinguished by this, but they're all uniquely isomorphic to each other. There's, a, there's an isomorphism between them. You can map from one to the other in a trivial way. The single object in one goes to a single object in the other and vice versa. And because the only morphism from it to itself is, is, um, is on any, if you compose those going one way and going the other way, the composition must be in this set, in this category. It must be the identity morphism. Therefore, they're isomorphic to each other. And there's only one such isomorphism. They're uniquely isomorphic. So they could always be collapsed. And in category theory, we consider things that are isomorphic to each other to be basically the same um, because we can always collapse them. Everything else views them the same way. They're isomorphic. There's everything else in the category sees them as the same way. Um, as exactly the same. They're interchangeable, they're commodities, and we could collapse them. Okay, so that's terminal object. Um, what's the terminal object here? Well, it's true, right? Here's, here's Boolean, um, and there's an arrow. The objects are false and true, and there's an arrow from one object to another if from, ob from, from object A to object B, if A implies B. False implies true, but true does not imply false. True implies true and false implies false. This is the category bool, and this is the terminal object. For it, there's unique morphism from every other, every object in the category, including itself, to itself. Hmm. Here's divisors of 30, um, and here, this is a terminal object, right? Um, every other object um, points to it. 
either directly or through composition. So one points to it. Um, and I just have not drawn the arrow by, by convention of a Hasse diagram. So there's an arrow from one to 30. And you can tell that because there's multiple routes by which it could get there uh, up to 30. And therefore, there, there must be a morphism to 30. The composition of these morphisms, say this, this one here, has to be a morphism from 1 to 30. This is a terminal object. OK. Um, so any other any questions about terminal objects or anything you want to discuss? Anything that's bothering you? about terminal objects in this definition. No, I'm not, not seeing any indication of interest. I'll try to have the chat window up in case people want to uh, use that. Um, but um, I will say, um, there's not, you notice that um, there's some arrows out of terminal object here, the terminal object one has arrows out of it. Um, there's nothing to stop that. There, the property of that distinguishes the terminal object, the universal property, says nothing about whether it has any morphisms to other objects. It just says every, every object of the category has unique morphism to the terminal object. It doesn't speak about the reverse. OK. The other type of object that that was talked about that's kind of of a similar flavor is the initial object. And the initial object, you know, where's my definition? Yeah. Um, an initial object at C is an object such that for any other object in C, so it's an object I, for any other object in C, there's a unique morphism from I to any other object. And once again, it doesn't have to exist. There are several that are uniquely isomorphic to one another. Um, and it turns out that you can define initial objects just as easily by considering the opposite of a category, the dual category. It's just the category, do I have a, yeah, here. Um, if, if we consider a category C, we can define C op just being same object as C, and the same morphisms are just viewed as being going the, the opposite direction. They're flipped. Um, so if there was a morphism from A to B, we view it as morphism from B to A. Okay. Um, and the, the morphisms are the same as in C. It's just that they're considered, interpreted as going the opposite direction. Um, okay. So... Um, the dual of the category, um, from, from the perspective of the dual of a category, initial objects uh, in C are the same as terminal objects in C op, just flipping the arrows. Because um, initial object has to have a unique object going to every other object, every, every object, I should say, uh, whereas the terminal object can. It has has it going to that object. And if we flip the arrows, you could see why it's a terminal object. So the initial object in set is the empty set. And this gets back to the question that was asked um, in a previous session. Um, you know, what is it with this functions from the empty set? Remember, category set, these morphisms are functions. So what we're saying is, if you consider the empty set as a set, and you ask, what are its morphisms? What are its functions 
how many functions are there to any other set, say with a set with three elements or a set with two elements? The number of morphisms um, is always one because there's nothing to do here. For terminal objects, we have nothing to choose. We have no choice. Here, there's nothing to do at all. The definition of a function says, for something to be a function, it says, if we consider a function from A to B, uh, it says for every each single possible element of A, we have to assign a B. And here, there are no elements of A. It's empty. So we're done. Like, I don't have to assign any elements here because there are none for which we have to assign. A is empty. There's nothing to do. Um, there's nothing that has to be specified. Therefore, we say there's a kind of a, a vacuous function. Um, it's, and in Haskell, it's called absurd. Um, and Bartosz actually, um, actually, I think it's, no, it's Brendan who, who introduces um, absurd within that lecture. Uh, it doesn't have to do anything. Um, it just, it just uh, is, uh, and there's exactly one of them to end from empty set to any other set. That's the initial object in category set. Um, you notice there, there happens to be happens to be no functions going the reverse direction because there are no functions except from it to itself. So empty set to itself, there's kind of of the vacuous absurd here too, but there's nothing from like one to this because you can't have a function that picks a value that that for the only value in one, it picks a value of the empty set, cannot do it. Or for each value of three, it picks a value of the empty set, cannot do it. Okay. Um, so in Boolean pre-order category, the same one we had, um, here's the initial object. It goes to every other object that is a self arrow, um, that's identity, and an arrow to true. Um, an arrow to true, yeah. Um, by the way, uh, morphisms here are either present or they're absent. There's, these are not functions, they are simply, um, present or absent indicating whether this uh, implies that. So the self arrow has to be, it's kind of the identity arrow. It, it has to be the identity arrow, it's just itself. Um, and here we have the initial object uh, being one. Um, it has unique morphism to every other, every other item within the category. And it was noted in the lecture in response to a question, if you defined one out of the category, so it's divis divisors of 30 except for one, um, well, you tell me, would there have been, if, if you excluded one, would there be uh, initial objects? And if so, what are they? So if you excluded one here, there we go. Um, if, if you excluded one, uh, would there be initial objects? If so, what would they be? If not, why not? Uh, I think there would be multiple initial objects and they would be the prime factors of 30. Okay, so that's that's a great idea. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. And it speaks to some intuitions um, because they'd be, um, they'd be, um, these kind of irreducible 
quantities. And then, then that does have something to do with these universal properties. The problem is there's an ugly, there's an ugly fact here, or you could say two ugly facts. Number one, um, remember an initial object has to have a unique morphism to every other object. And like two doesn't, ooh, I'm sorry. Two doesn't divide 15 and five doesn't divide six. So um, that's a fly in the ointment. The other thing is they, they don't have links to each other. Like five doesn't divide three, two doesn't divide three, two doesn't divide five, almost by definition, because these are prime, right? Um, they don't divide each other. And as a result, these kind of look initial and we'll, we'll come back to an intuition, which may lead you to think that way in just a minute. But, but if you think about it more, the, it does not support this definition that they have a unique morphism to every other one. Um, okay. Um, I will say though, I mean, Alex is on to something there because, um, as we'll see, some of the reasoning that we'll be using for pair, for product, we'll be trying to give this notion of kind of what's the, the mediating object, what's the, the most basic object. Um, this notion of universality and having a universal property is often asking, what's the most basic component of it? And these, these are basic at a certain level. But um, in, in, this, in this case, they're, they're not going to be able to qualify as, as initial. Um, anyone have a further question about that before we talk about Hask? OK. Um, so here's Hask. OK, now I'm in trouble. This thing is sort of there. Um, so in Haskell, the, the terminal object is something that's mapped to uniquely, uh, this is actually the, the unit type. And we also denote an instance of it using this unit token like this. Um, and uh, this is, is terminal, so, oh my gosh, this is bogus. This should say A goes to, to the unit, not, not, um, not the reverse. Uh, out, out, black spot, uh, I wish we could cover it. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's try that, yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, these arrows, oh, just what I thought it was gone. Um, these arrows here all go from another type um, into this, um, this unit value um, or this unit type. Um, so, um, because there's, if you have something that maps from bool to unit, there's only one possible function, something that takes no matter what bool it's given, it gives a unit, right? Double, no matter what double you're given, you just give back this value, it's unique. And I've kind of indicated that by putting in these arrows, these kind of dashed arrows. Meanwhile, this is the initial object, void. Um, here, void is the type, it has no possible values. Um, because there's no possible values, this kind of this, vacuous function of it to every other type, which you'll see here drawn out in rather um, florid ways. Um, the one thing that's, um, that's colored differently is this blue one, which is going to the terminal object. So there is one to the terminal object here, but this is the source of these unique arrows, void. It's a type with no possible values. Um, and this is the definition of absurd. It maps from void to any other type A. 
Okay. Um, um, so types are composed of sets of values. And, and so the, you know, these two are really inspired by set because types here are sets of possible values, like sets of integers, sets of doubles, sets of Boolean values. Really void kind of represents no possible values like the empty set and the terminal type has only one possible value. It's like a singleton set. Um, so these operate as the initial object and the terminal object within Hask. Any questions on this? Okay, not, not hearing any questions. So I'll just note, um, you may think, well, that's very nice. Um, uh, you know, may sort of, you may think of these as quirks, but this is a reflection that pretty much every categorical construction that I can think of um, has its Haskell analog like pair does, as we'll see in just a second. Um, but other things do as well. Um, Coproduct, so pair is an example of a product. Coproduct has its Haskell analogs here. There's coproduct structures where you have an either, for example. Exponential, there's exponentials here, like this function type. Um, so all these constructs we create in category theory as universal constructions, they have this universal property, we can find analogs to them, at least all that I'm thinking within the pseudo category of Hask, ref reflected the fact it's a pseudo category of quite high fidelity. Um, those can live in here and it's quite nice. Um, uh, we'll see them emerge and they'll have these universal properties associated with them of uniqueness. Okay, so um, to help motivate that a little bit more, um, you know, we, we looked at this example of product, um, which was implemented as, as the pair construct um, here with, with pair. Now, this, this is worth looking at more closely, okay? Um, um, this diagram, it's gonna come back um, at times in category theory. Uh, and it appeals to concepts like involving projections that will be revisited. So, I want to walk through this. So we have two sets, A and B. And what this is talking about is products in set specifically. So we're trying to build up intuitions for products as a categorical construction, regardless of the category. But we're going to start with set. And the idea is that um, we have a notion of pairs. And if you want, products uh, of two sets that we already appeal to. So these pairs are elements of this product set A cross B. Uh, this is a pair A and three or B and three, um, pair A and two and B and two. Um, so we have these sets A and B uh, and we could talk about pairs of them. Great, great. And we might say this is the Cartesian product, great, of these sets. Indeed, that's the case. But 
normally we think of that in a very element wise way. We kind of look inside and we say, yeah, that's it. Look at the elements of here, that's it. And what category theory is pointing us to is, well, wait, it's, it's, it's challenging us. You know, can we define this in a, oops, in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't have to appeal to these sets? You know, it doesn't have to appeal to these elements, doesn't involve looking at the elements and reasoning about the elements. Can we, affine, can we appeal to this in a way that purely is defined in terms of these as morphisms, the roles they play in the category, rather than thinking about them as sets? Uh, and if we can do that, then we have this chance of generalizing it to any category. That's kind of the idea here. Um, but to develop the intuitions, Brendan started with this notion. Okay, imagine if this is a singleton set. A function from singleton set to, to B, what is that really doing? That's doing what? It's doing what to B? A function from a singleton set, of, a set of one possible value to B is essentially doing what to B? It's begins with P, it ends with G. It has a K in it. Oh. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was gonna it's say pick, probe, but. Uh... Kind of like that. There, there was this notion of it as a probe, um, but it's, picking an element of B in, in particular, right? If you have one possible value here, what's that function? Well, if you tell me that function, I mean, it only has one possible value. So all you have choices is of one of the elements of B, right? Like three, okay. So there's a single function here for three. There's a different function for two. There's a different function here for one, right? Um, uh, so basically G is, is a function that specifies a value for, for B. That's what G's job in life is to spec specify a value for B. We call these the generalized elements at one point um, of B. There's one of them for every value of B. And similarly, there's one of them and one F for every value of, of this set A, right? Um, F is essentially specifying a value of A here. G is specifying a value of B. And the claim is that if you know that, it would uniquely specify a value of A cross B. So if F specified A and G specified three, then this function, um, there's a unique function that picks out A comma three. If G were to specify special, specified two instead, then that function is going to pick out a comma comma two. So the idea you was trying to appeal to is here. You know, um, if this were singleton set, there's a unique function here. Uh, if we know F and we know G, we can pick a value of this. Um, so um, we could kind of go between these two. And why is that? Well, these things here, and this is a key concept, they're called projection maps. And what they do is they project down, and I've tried to draw it with these lines, along this axis. So it's projecting down to A by taking out the first element of it, or project down to B by taking the second element of it. Um, that's why these kind of lines go down to B, down to B, down to B. Um, here we're taking the, the, the third element, I mean, or the second or the first. So this projection map, all it does is given one of these, it extracts the second element here. This projection map, given one of these, it extracts the first element. Um, this is a function here. It maps from the, the pair down to this and the pair down to that. And the claim is here that 
Well, look, these things have to commute. I mean, if you, this triangle has to commute. If you first do this, pick a singleton set and you go down here and let's suppose it picks a three. I'm mm, oh, sorry, yeah, with G. G picks a three. Mm. Well, there's, there's a function that, int that is mediated by the appropriate value of A cross B. Um, that if you go down to it, then it'll pick uh, it'll pick the three here. It basically the composition of this and this will pick that three. But G is not enough to uniquely define this. It has to be G and F. So if you told me an F gives B, and you told me G gave three. I would say, okay, this gives B comma three. That's this one here. And, and then if we project it down here, we get three. If we project it down here, we get B. So for every pair of F and G, every pair of them here, uh, we have a function H that makes this Try these triangles both commute. You come down here, and then you go this way. It's the same as G. So, so to give the example of G, we're picking three. We come down here. Uh, our function H we know is picking B comma three, and then you project, and we get three. Great. But this function also has to make this commute, and F is picking B. So you come down here, you pick B comma three, and then you go down here and you get B. Great. So this triangle commutes. So this, this triangle is something which um, has this unique property that for any pair F and G, there's a unique function that picks one of these that will make this triangle commute, given that these are projection maps, things that just extract the first or the second element. Um, that's, that's the idea here. And vice versa, if we had an H that's a unique function here, that the only possible value it gives us one of these, we can uniquely define f and g. If this function h gave us, you know, a comma two, then we know g has to give us what? If if this function h gave us a comma two, what does g have to give us? Two. Two. And what does F has to give us? A. A. All right. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. given H, we specify, that's basically specifying fixing F and G. If we give F and G, it's basically fixing what H is. It's just a pair of what F gives and what G gives. And it turns out that this is true in general for an arbitrary set C, okay? An arbitrary set C, this is also true. Um, so if C is a two element set, it's basically picking pair of A cross B. So for one thing, we might pick B comma three. Another one, we pick A comma two. Great, and that's gonna be, the same as picking a pair of F and G's. So, sorry, that's not that's not put well. Um, that's picking that's picking a pair, each of which has a value of F and G. Um, so, um, here we're we're starting to to think more categorically. To, to leave this element view behind and start talking about a unique morphism. What defines a product 
from a relationship perspective, not an element perspective, is the fact that there's this unique property that for any other, for any other object C, or in fact, any object C in the category, uh, given this pattern where we have projection maps here, um, and we have this object C, um, if this is our product within that category, um, there is for every value of morphisms F and G, there is a unique morphism here by which uh, that, that is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the pair of F uh, and G. So um, specifying F and G uniquely determines, uh, the morphisms F and G uniquely determines this morphism such that this commutes, this triangle commutes and this triangle commutes. Um, and, and this gets back to Alex's intuition, which was good before with those prime factors. The idea is that, look, any other object in the category that might have these morphisms, you notice these morphisms F and G look a little bit like these morphisms from A cross B to object A and object B. And what this is saying is from, from a, a categorical standpoint, product is kind of the, the, the essence of, it, or it's the best, or it's the simplest, it's the, the most, uh, most succinct, or the most, um, um, the most basic of these type of objects. Because this, this has a structure a little bit like this one. This one has the structure A cross B that you have this map and you have this map uh, or this morphism and this morphism. And C is the same basic structure, but it's saying A cross B is this very special one that every other one goes through it and goes through it with unique morphism. So A cross B is kind of the closest mediating object to objects A and B. It uniquely specifies Sorry, um, and uh, and so it's kind of the essence of producthood. Some other pretender for producthood, C, um, has to go through this one. So suppose maybe C is some horrible thing, like like maybe C is a triple, right? And it has A and B, but it has some added information with it needlessly. Um, needlessly, it's, it has some extra baggage with it, right? Um, then, like that one, does it have a map here to A? Yeah, it's a, in fact a projection map here to get us to A. It's a projection map to get us to B. But it could be uniquely specified in terms of a pair. Um, there's a unique morphism down where it just throws away its third element, maps the two elements down. Um, uh, and this is then the projection map. And so here, this is the more basic one. This is a less basic one. This triple, yeah, it, it kind of plays the role, kind of a similar role, but this is more basic. And we say that this factorizes that or this is mediated by this. This is kind of the more, more basic of them. It's the more elemental of them. It's, it's the more perfect of them or the more, um, you know, yes, more essential of them, um, A cross B. This other one, it plays that role, but it's, it's not the essence of the role. Whereas this one is, this is the one-stop shop for pairhood for, Producthood. Um, it's this A cross B. Um, in any category, uh, this is kind of what makes this guy commute. Or sorry, what what defines this guy? Every other object that's in this form um, uh, has to factorize through this. Has to go through it 
with unique morphism um, that makes this diagram commute here. So that's the notion of sort of a product here. Um, so this is a sort of product as an arbitrary structure. And we'll see coproduct is just the flip of this arrow wise, where we have injections instead. Um, and, you know, it, it is saying that given an H and given an F, so that's given a, oh, this is back in set, but given a map from C to A, and for a given set, C to A and C to B, we have a map from C to A comma um, B. Okay. Um, so uh, it was asked before uh, in, in lecture, Brendan asked, but Bartosz didn't give time to really think about it or answer. What's the product in this category? Can anyone tell me? What's product in this Boolean pre-order category? Anyone? What is product? Well, I'll give you a hint. You should be looking for an object that's kind of as close as possible to the two things that it's trying to product, um, productize. So suppose, suppose we were to take the product of F and T, false and true. What would the product of those two be? What would it need to be? It would need to be the closest object to those things through which every other object that, that can be mapped to those things passes, okay? So, so here we have false and true are the things we're trying to take the product of. Those are kind of A and B down here. What, what thing is such that every, every other object in the category goes through the product. What, what would the product have to be for that to be the case? And the product has an arrow. Note the product has an arrow, pi one to A, and it has an arrow pi two to B. You can see that there's an arrow there. It's gotta be an arrow. So if we consider the product of these, the product has to have an arrow to every other object, uh, to the object, sorry, yeah, I misspeak, to the objects we're, we're, we're multiplying or of which we're taking a product. So if we were to take a product of, of false and true, what's the object closest to them that has an object to both of them? Uh, false because it has an false. arrow to true and identity false. arrow to itself. That's exactly right. Exactly. It would have to be false. False has an arrow to itself and it has this identity arrow, uh, an identity arrow to itself and it has the arrow to true. Let's suppose we were to take the product of true and true. What would that have to be? Two What's identity the closest errors? thing? Uh, sorry? Uh -huh. Two identity Two errors? identity. Yeah. And so what would the product itself? The product is an object. And what's that object that's, that's sort of the closest to true and true um, such that everything else goes through it? It is the object. That, the product is an object. And it is true. It is true. The, the two projections, just as Alex said, are the identities, true to true and true to true. But this is the mediating object. This is the product. The product is true. And any other object, say here, false, goes through it in order to reach those, those two. Um, it, it can be factorized as going through it to reach those two, um, true and true. 
So the product of true and true is what? It's true. True. What's the product of false and false? Okay, we want the object closest to it through which all other objects that have an arrow um, to the, so if we're taking the product of A and B, of A and B, we want to have the object that's closest to A and B such that any other object that has an arrow to A and has an arrow to B goes through this product. Okay, that's a lot to, to say, but. False. False, yeah. So does this lead us to the fact that the product operator is and? Is and. Pro and is the product in Boolean pre-order category. That is what is product in that category. It's and, it's the and operator. Um, you might guess what co-product is, um, it's or, uh, but this is, um, this is and. Yeah, so again, if you're taking the product of any two things, it's false and false, this would be false, this would be false. And any other object that has, any other object that has these mappings to false and false needs to go through the product. In this case, there's actually no other object that has a mapping to false and false. So we don't have to worry about that, um, that side. There's just, this is the only possible one that is closest to those. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's false. Um, so the product of true and false is false. Product of false and true is false. Product of false and false is true. Uh, sorry, it's false. Um, it, it, all those are false and true and true is true. Yeah. Okay. Here, what would the what would the product be in this divisor space? What would the product be? So suppose we were to take say we want to take the product of um, ten and fifteen. What would that be? That's the one Brendan uses actually. Class. What's the product of 10 and 15 here in this category? Okay, it's gotta be the closest object to them of the two things we're, of which we're taking the product, 10 and 15. The product has to be the closest object to them such that any other object that goes to both of them Remember, this goes to both this and this. So if there's an object that's is a pretender to be A cross B, it, it thinks I'm better than A cross B. Um, I also have these maps, you know, to both of these guys. It has to go through the product. So, so here we have 10 and 15. So for any other object that is a link to both of them, it has to go through this other object. What would that be for 10 and 15? Well, is there another object that goes to both 10 and 15? It's kind of one singular unitary element, right? That goes to both 10 and 15. What is it? What is it? It's one. What's the closest one to 10 and 15 through which all of those go? It's five, right? So we're multiplying by 10 and 15. We want to find the value that's closest to them such that it mediates all other paths that go to them, to both, to both of these. The only thing that goes to both 10 and 15 other than five is one. 
One goes to, to 15 through three here, one goes to 10 through five. So five would need for one and for any other object that goes to both, it's only one, it needs to go through five. So five is the product here. What's the product of six and 10? Anyone? What's two? the product of six? Yeah, it's two. It's the closest to them, forgive the pun. It's the closest in proximity to six and 10. It's in closest proximity to six and 10. And all of their objects that divide them, here one, go through it. So what is this? There's actually a, a term for this. It's a three word phrase. Is it the greatest common factor? Yes, yeah, the greatest common divisor. Exactly, exactly. And if you want to ask, just like this, what I told you, the co-product that kind of was the spoiler, I told you it was or, all the product is and. Here, the co-product is, anyone want to guess? Least common multiple of them. Okay. Um, and in general, oh man, I should really have it. In general, for a, a pre order, or if it's a total order, man, we should, we should have a total order. Man, um, what is, oh man, um, I got to do this. Like, I, how could I not do this? Um, fortunately, I just have office hours after this for this class. So, um, here we go. Um, okay, I don't even have my tablet fired up, but um, if if we have a, uh, there we have a nice category, right? Um, and uh, mumble, um, okay, we're gonna draw a nice, uh, nice tiny circle. There we go. And here we go. Um, uh, so, if we have a total order, so it looks something like this. Um, this is brutal, but um, it'll do. Uh, so we have something like this, right? Um, hey, oh no. Okay. Um, uh, cool. Uh, okay, and and then we'll. Uh, okay, uh, and hey, come on, give, give me. Get me back here. Can I? Oh, come on. Come on. Oh, no. Okay. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, okay. Well, uh, maybe, maybe uh, the uh, gods of selection won't favor this. Um, okay. If we have a total order, uh, I, I think you see where I'm trying to go with this. Um, a total order like this, maybe it's the naturals, for example. Maybe it's the reals, maybe it's the integers. If I have this sort of total order, um, uh, what is the, anyone wanna say what the product would be here? And so on, There's dot, 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 dot. So suppose we add, I'm gonna label each of these. This is gonna be one, um, boom, one. Um, and this is going to be, oh, no, come on. Um, this is going to be two and the next will be three and so on. Um, so what's the, what's the product here? Anyone? So what would the product be? Suppose we were to take the product of two and three. So what we want is, is what? So we want the closest value. So by the way, the arrow represents, it's an arrow from A to B if A is less than or equal to B, right? This is sort of the classic order 
uh, category with the, the numbers. Um, so the product of two and three will be the closest object to them that any other object that has, has links to both two and to three goes through it. So you want the closest thing to two and three such that any other thing that has an arrow directly or, or through composition, indirectly through the composition of these other arrows goes through this, this product one. What, what would that be? Anyone? So for two and three, what would it be? What would it be? Product of two and three. It's going to be what here? It's going to be the one closest to them through which any other one goes to it. Well, does zero, let me ask this as a clarification. Um, does zero have a link to two here? Just a, a, a notational clarification. Does zero have a link to two? Uh, you're some, uh, like, there's like a box covering up part of the, oh. the circle. I think that might be the chat window. Yeah, there we go. No, the, oh, okay. Is that, oh, it's covering it. That's yeah, weird, part of it. it was separate. Okay, sorry. Does, does zero have a link to two here? This is a pre order category. So, in other words, like an arrow means like zero is less than or equal to one, one is less than or equal to. Does zero have a link to two? Yeah, through the composition of the other two. It arrows. does, through the composition. Yes, it does. Yeah, just isn't shown. Does zero have a link to three? Yep. Is zero the product of two and three? No, I think that would be would, two. The two, two is the product of them. Now let's take the product of two and four. What would that have to be? Product of two and four. Also two. Also two. Because any, whatever the product is, it has to be something that any other one that has a length both to two and four. So any of these in short that are less than both of them, right? Goes through it. So product is the, anyone want to guess? It is the minimum. Product is the min here of those two. Because any other object that is linked to both two and four, in other words, those objects must be less than or equal to two and less than or equal to four, has got to, um, has got to go through this product and you know the only one that's going to go through it to 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 the minimum of these is got to be the minimum of it mm -hmm. um so this would be an example of that okay um two now if these were real numbers we wouldn't be able to draw them out just like this right be like 2.000. There's always one more uh, up there. And so it would be kind of the limit associated with it. It'll be like, okay, if you were considering everything, you were taking, you know, the, you were considering the product associated with many, many, many things, like the entire line between zero and one. The, the product is going to be zero, um, even if even if the, the line is only considered from a little bit like uh, 
it's considered close to zero. Uh, it's not, even if zero is not in it, zero is the minimum because everything else will have to go through it. Um, that is, is linked to, to each of them. I think that's, I think this is correct. Um, so this is an example of a limit. Um, and anyone want to guess what the, what the co-product uh, co-product would be for these? It's going to be the, if you flip the arrows around and you're asking what, what's kind of the, the closest one to both, it's going to be the max, the max of them. Um, okay, so this is um, this is this notion of, of sort of producthood. And you notice we describe this notion of producthood in a way that dispenses with the need to reason about these these original objects, which I've elided here. All we're doing is we're talking about morphisms that this product is an object in the category such that for any other object that has two morphisms, one to A, one to B, um, there exists a unique morphism going to the product morphism, to the product object, such that, such that this triangle commutes, the product object has to have these projection maps, such that this triangle commutes and that triangle commutes, okay? Um, and, uh, and you could see a definition of it here and you could see once again, this is the universal property associated with it. Product is universal construction and the universal property is such that for any other object C, there exists unique, um, or there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the morphisms from C to A and C to B, the pair of those morphisms with the object with the morphisms to A cross B. Um, so that um, that is the notion of product more generally. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's uh, the general notion of product and. Uh, what Bartosz showed in his component was that there's this, you know, he showed this isomorphism. So given these maps, uh, F, which is C to A and G, which is C to B, you can implement a map that's shown right here, which takes in a C and gives a pair of A, B. So it gives this guy here for it. And given a pair of these, a map, sorry, an H from C to A cross B, uh, we can always produce a pair of C to A and C to B, a pair of these. So given one of these, uh, we can define an F and G. So in short, these ones are in one-to-one -one correspondence with these. Um, there's, uh, and in fact, there's just one of these. Um, so there's a unique definition for H that gives um, uh, that gives this correspondence. Uh, and this backwards E exclamation point means there exists a single one here, uh, such that these these commute. That's the check check mark here. And so here the untuple, all it does is it. If we want to unpack it into these guys, all we do is is take take this guy first, and then do this, and that has to be exactly the same as F. We take uh, if we have this one, and we take that, we get G, and that's exactly what he's defined. Uh, uh, that these uh, so so this is F. And uh, this is G here. Sorry, F and G. Okay. Um, and then he noted, you know, given that uh, you you can define here a mapping between these, which is actually what's associated with uh, a bifunctor, but um, 
going from pair a b to pair a prime b prime um, uh, in in this sort of way so here we lift a function from two functions one going a to a prime one going b to b prime to go from pair of a b to pair of a prime b prime um, sort of lifts both of those simultaneously um, from being just from a to b or from a to a prime and b to b prime to go from pair a b to pair a prime b uh, a prime b prime okay any questions on this though before we wrap up we're definitely the office hour um component of this but any any questions or further discussion. Okay. Um, so I declare the class, this session closed, and I will now be open for office hours for anyone who would like to uh, remain. Thanks very much.